Welcome everyone and in sort of our pre-game meeting here, I hope I didn't say anything too off. Um, my name is Mike Lewis and I want to welcome everyone to the Fandom Analytics Webinar brought to you guys by the Emory Marketing Analytics Center. Our mission here is really to bring interesting people and interesting content, you know, people that work at the people that operate in arenas where, you know, really intense fandom or passion or consumer behavior, where that is really kind of the, the main thing that drives a, a given industry. And so today we've got someone that fits that perhaps better than just about anyone. So not from a traditional marketing role, but we're going to be joined by, or we are joined by Jay Busby from Yahoo Sports. Um, now, like I said, I think Jay is the perfect guest for this in a, in a lot of ways. He's, he's a longtime friend of the program at Emory. He has, um, you know, he, he's been coming to class for a number of years, actually served as an executive in residence for, for I think, two years, right, Jay? Right. And, you know, we're going to get him back in there as soon as things go a little bit back to normal and we get sort of out of this pure kind of strange COVID Zoom classroom environment. Um, but like I said, Jay is a senior writer for Yahoo Sports. And, you know, the body of work or the, the range of sports that he has covered is amazing to me. Um, the, the Super Bowl, the Olympics, uh, the Masters. Um, Jay's written a book. I think the book is called Earnhardt Nation. So a book that is focused on NASCAR, right? And so Jay lives in a world where he is, you know, telling stories to fans. So he is, like I said, kind of a perfect guest for someone to come in and talk about how fanaticism, craziness, passion kind of rules the world. So I'm glad that you could join us, Jay. It is absolutely my pleasure. I was saying earlier, I love coming into the class. I love speaking to class and I love walking around like a like a televangelist you know just walking through the class and, and around and making sure that nobody's asleep but i can't do that now i mean if i do that now i'm going to look like i'm you know in a, in a prison with a security camp or something like that so so it's a, it's a little bit of a different framework but it's fun to hang out awesome so the format for today will be similar to uh, the, the past webinars we'll start with a conversation focused on you know the, the the fun topic for me is this is the anniversary day of when essentially sports got shut down. I think it was, was at halftime of the Big East game where I think things really right. ended. Uh, so it's the anniversary of one year of the shutdown of sports. And also I want to spend some time talking about the art of storytelling, something that is important for everyone in and out of the world of marketing. Uh, throughout the conversation, absolutely encourage everyone to share their thoughts, share their questions in the question and answer box at the, at the bottom of the webinar screen. Uh, Doug Battle, who you can also see on the screen, is the communications specialist and sports analytics specialist for the Marketing Analytics Center. Doug will curate those questions and we will move to, we'll move to those questions uh, sort of uh, in relatively short order here. So like I said, I think this is a tremendous opportunity for everyone to ask any question about <laughs> you know nascar to the tokyo olympics yes okay. we can go in any direction you want okay so jay to start things out like i said the anniversary of you know two days after the rudy gobert press conference the anniversary of when the big east tournament ended at halftime what were your initial thoughts when this all started to I don't know, crumble or? Yeah, fall? yeah. I mean, I on Yahoo, uh, as part of Yahoo, I'm a, a member of a team called the Tentpole Team. And Tentpoles in journalistic uh, speak are the big events that kind of prop up the entire year. You know, Super Bowl, the Olympics, the ones that you mentioned, Daytona 500, things of that nature. And so we could see pretty early, we were already starting to gear up for one of our Tentpole events, which is the NCAA tournament. But we could see pretty quickly that, this was taking a different direction. So as the day was starting to unfold and we were starting to see more and more cancellations or people, there, were, there was already talk that people, there were gonna be games without people in them, without fans in them. That, that in, in itself is enough of a story to, to go red alert. But then 
as the day started falling apart more and more, we realized that this was going to be far larger than that. And so we started looking for stories. The one that I was looking for, that I was looking at, was there was a Hawks game going on as this was all falling apart, as the, the, the Thunder game was getting postponed and eventually canceled. Uh, the Hawks were playing. They were in the middle of a game against the Knicks. And we very quickly realized that this might be the last game mm. of Vince Carter, who's obviously one of the great NBA players in history. And so I live north of Atlanta. I immediately jumped into the car. Um, I started heading down. I didn't have a press pass, but I figured I could probably talk my way in. Um, I have a very distinct memory of, of calling my mother because today is also her birthday. So this is how I like to remember this day rather than as COVID day. I remember calling her and saying, I'm heading down. And, and she was, of course, worried as, as, as mothers ought to be. And I was driving down Georgia 400 and hit a dead stop. And, and if you're familiar with Atlanta traffic, you know that these things come up. So I, it, it completely stopped. I never did make it down. I stayed on the phone conversing with the fellow members of my team. And we started to figure out exactly how we were going to address this. Obviously, I wasn't going to be able to make it down. Um, but we had to look at this not as a, we had to look at this from a journalistic perspective and, and not, not, as to how it made us personally feel, you know, our families were safe and everything. So we had to start looking about how are we going to roll this forward? What does this mean? How long will, will places be shut down? And no one knew anything. And that was the, that's a, that's a tremendous problem when you need to get news out to the public and there's no news to, to, to be had. So that was our initial reaction. And then from there, it was just a matter of trying to keep ahead of the, the cascading waves of news that just seemed to roll in every hour. So what were the, what were the first couple stories that you wrote part post-March 11th? Yeah, well, the first one that, I mean, again, I had a, another failed attempt. I was going to drive down to the Players' Championship, which is going on right now uh, down on the coast of Florida near Jacksonville. And I was going to, because they had played, let's see if I can remember this right. They played the first day with fans in attendance, but then they were going to have fans, they were going to block it off from fans and play it through the weekend without, without fans at all. They were one of the last people to cancel because they actually played the next day. Um, and then they canceled it outright once it became obvious that it was that that was going to be done. So that trip got got nixed for me. My next move after that was I ended up going to what was the only event, the only sports event happening in America at the time, pretty much, which was a professional bull riders association, uh, a bull riding out in Duluth, Georgia, out at the uh, Infinite Energy Arena. Uh, so I was kind of on that on that last moments of American sports beat. I was following these last little events as they, as they collapsed. And we had, uh, obviously we were all, our entire team was on, was on high alert. We were reaching out to epidemiologists. We were trying to reach out to teams. It, it's, it's a matter of just trying to figure out what the story is without speculating. And, and that's hugely difficult as you know, because everyone wants to know, okay, is this going to, this is going to mean the masters is gone. Is this going to mean the NCAA tournament's gone? Is this going to mean uh, baseball is delayed? And, and you, you're, you're balancing what you want as a, as an individual, which is not to have society collapse with the reality of what you're hearing, which is that some of the most fundamental elements of our society are shutting down. And, and that was what we were, we were trying to juggle over those first few days. So and I'll move on here in just a second, but how did you approach the bull riding story? <laughs> uh, you know, because I mean... I, I went back and read my story this morning, and, <laughs> and it's really interesting because uh, the, the lead to the story is about the bull ride. It's, it was a weird story because I, the lead to the story, I was trying to do some weird literary thing with the bull rider, but, but then in the story... I'm, I wrote about all of the things that are, are natural to us now. Now we weren't wearing masks. I remember that, but everything else, you know, all that I wrote about how weird it was to see signs about COVID-19 and, and being asked not to come in if you had symptoms and, and, you know, getting temperature checks and all that. And I wrote about that as if it was, you know, out of a science fiction novel, because at the time it was now, you know, it's, it's perfectly normal. You see those signs everywhere warning you about COVID-19, but uh, it was, it was a strange thing. It was, it, there, there were a lot of people who were um, very uncertain about the effect that it would have. And, and this, as it turned out, you know, I didn't realize this at the time, but this was sort of a key way that the entire pandemic would unfurl because these bull riders, and I won't go into a bull riding discussion, but they basically, they make money for as long as they stay on the bull. You know, they get judged. And if they get thrown off before the time, they get $0 for that, that night, you know, that event. 
Um, so it was in their best interests, obviously, to stay on the bull. And, and you can see the metaphor there. These guys wanted to, you know, needed to make money. And the prospect of shutting down for a week, two weeks, a month, a year, I mean, it would have been devastating to them. And so that was, I didn't pick up on it at the time entirely because they didn't know how severe it was going to be. But that was the, that was the central threat of, of what they were facing. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, my memory gets a little bit hazy in terms of thinking back. And, you know, obviously the universities were all shutting down as well. And, to, and I think almost everyone was saying, well, it'll be a two-week period, right? The, the right. Fed and the curve. And then there'll be some sort of gradual opening. And so I, I get a little bit ha hazy thinking back to the world of sports where, you know, some of these things were temporary and then they just kept getting extended. So, if I mean, if I recall correctly, we had a few things going on. Like, well, wasn't it um, NASCAR had the guys play a video game? Yes. And, yes. Uh, you know, and, and so that that next part, that next phase where people were trying to adapt and still get a little bit of content out there. Uh, I mean, what are your memories of that? And we're. Yeah, we had, I mean, we were. I don't want to, I don't ever recall floundering because I literally, everybody said, well, you know, you must be happy. You can kick back now. There's no <laughs> sports. I was never more busy in my entire life than that time from mid March to late April. I mean, that six weeks I was constantly working and it was constant. And it was, it was a different kind of work because you're finding out different ways to, to, to reach out to your readers, to connect your readers, to make sure that they're informed. And I remember one story I wrote, on marble racing, which was on YouTube. I mean, this this dude had literally was literally racing marbles, and and you could bet on the marbles, and, and you know they had fifteen of them rolling down a track. This is the, the I mean, we've kind of let this slip out of our collective memory now, which is probably a good thing. But this is where we were at. We were watching effing marbles go down a track, and and so there was some of that. Uh, you know, there was some of the, I, I moved over into the, the news section of things, the news side of things, because Georgia was such an epicenter of so much that was happening in terms of reopening that I worked with Yahoo News, our news division, on some, some reopening stories as well. But, I mean, there was a lot of, uh, of stories. It was kind of like a, you know, BCAD kind of thing where you, there was this exact point and everything was either in, related to that or, or how that had, how it transformed from that moment. I wrote a story about a, a women's football team that was trapped in Honduras when the wall came down and they had to get flown out by the State Department because they were stuck there on, a, on an exhibition tour. So finding those kinds of stories, tracking those sorts of stories down, that's, that's what I spent a lot of time doing. Okay, then I think, at least in my mind, and you know, if you've got another sort of act or event that you think was relevant, you know, correct me. But to me, then the next act was so we had this this shock to the system. You know, suddenly everything was disconnected. Sports were gone except for a Michael Jordan documentary, right? Right. Then we entered into a period of social unrest. To put it as you know, kind of as, I don't know, as generically as possible, sure. that also had incredible, incredible ramifications for all of sports. And, and so COVID to George Floyd, for someone in, in your business thinking about, you know, how fans are going to, the, the stories that fans want to see, you know, how did this next act sort of inform how you operated. Yeah, that was a, that was a tremendous upheaval. Um, we have a very vocal section of our fan base that wants athletes to stick to sports. And, and they will, they, they say that athletics, you know, that sports has never been political except in the last few years. That's patently untrue. Every element of the Olympics is political. Uh, the, the fact that we have, more races than whites in sports is because of politics. Uh, the national anthem being played, military flyovers, it's all political, but it's, it's so much a part of what we've seen in sports for so many years that, that a lot of people took it for granted and assumed that it wasn't political. All of a sudden, now you had people who were athletes who were standing up wanting to voice their voice, the wanting to, to use their platform to speak on behalf of social justice. And there were a whole lot of people who didn't like that because they were opposed to the idea of athletes being anything other than entertainers, which is, you know, again, a patently unfair 
uh, restriction to place on someone to say you you can't because you're capable of dunking a basketball you're not allowed to say anything else uh, on, on on the matter of politics it's it's, it's absurd beyond that from a media perspective this was a news story we were relating the news and some of course some people will will opine on the news and some people will merely relate it but to ignore it would have been impossible not just impossible but irresponsible and so we got a lot of blowback from people who didn't want to hear about athletes joining in these protests but it's kind of a situation of of what do you want us to do we can't report on a a game where the Milwaukee Bucks walk out of the game, out of the playoff game. We can't just say, well, the game wasn't played tonight without reporting why it happened, what the background was, put the, put the full context in there. And there were, it, it, was a, it was a difficult balance to walk. And I don't think that, that anybody has really figured out the way to walk that completely yet, because once you open the door to, to having political voices, you open the door wide and, and, your tolerance for hearing someone else's political views is going to be different from someone else's. I mean, and I can, I can understand this. I can sympathize with people who just want to watch a game, but you know, it's, it, it, it's, that's not happening anymore. That's just not the way it is. The society has progressed forward to the point that sports is now a venue for politics and, and vice versa for that matter. Well, let, let me ask you a, a question from a, let me sort of, you know, go, a question related to what you just said, but from a very marketing standpoint. Yeah. And you know, you can tell me if it's kind of a, an off base question or sounds, sounds strange. When athletes start to have, you know, advocate for policy, um, become more political, then suddenly let's say the, the, the fan, the fan always had a relationship with the team. So the consumer had a relationship with the brand. And so now the athletes are, changing the nature of those brands and so from your vantage point in terms of looking at the world of sports i understand where the athletes are coming from right, right. It's, it's it's a moment in time what was your sense in terms of how the teams felt about it a complicated question because they were balancing the needs of their athletes with the desires of mm -hmm. their fan base and a lot of the fans didn't want to hear it. A lot of yeah. fans, and they made it very well known. The question is, um, to, to be blunt, how much does a business need to pay attention to the needs of a loud segment of its consumers? And I'm not placing a value judgment on anything. I'm just saying there, there might be a loud but small segment. Can a business safely say, you know what? We're, we're going to move ahead this way. And if you don't want to follow us, that's fine. And, you know, some businesses have done this. They've moved in a more progressive direction, realizing full well that they're going to get blowback for it. And they, they accept that moving in this direction is better for business mm -hmm. than, than trying to placate people who, who want things to stay the way that they were. Um, that's, the, that's the balance that all leagues deal with now. This that all of the leagues made a, a strong effort toward uh, acknowledging social justice, they would have messaging on the field, they would have commercials, they would have promotions, they would have, they would permit players to kneel before the anthem. And then, and as time went on, that sort of tapered off and sort of tapered off and you, and you stopped hearing about it quite so much. And, and that's where the real uh, debate is, is, is how much of it is for show and to kind of placate people on both sides of this issue. And then how much of it is really genuine dedication to the cause and and that's that's something that again is is not a simple answer as we could we could spend an entire semester on that yeah that, that that's interesting to me because in in a way i and i think you're you're right that the these efforts to you know in some ways maybe these teams have lost some control over their brands right that the players now have more control over the brands and the team's efforts to kind of steer that ship don't look authentic to right. anyone perhaps right so the next, and, and related to what you were mentioning, when sports came back, sports came back in a very strange way, right? They, yeah. they came back in bubbles. Um, were you allowed inside the bubbles? How did you cover sports in the bubble? Um, I'm trying to think. I was allowed in, a, in at least one bubble. I was allowed in the master's bubble. Uh, I, I got into that and we had to get, that was in November. 
uh, I got tested and, you know, I mean, literally you had to, to wait before you went in and, and you get tested and then, and then they assume that you're going to be safe because by then it was a little farther on. I was not part of the NBA bubble. We had one of our crew there that was part of that. I mean, that was a, that was a commitment. I mean, that was uh, three months in the bubble in Disney World, which is like, it, it, it sounds like one of those careful what you wish for things. You know, I'd love to spend three months at Disney World. Well, congratulations. You're stuck in a hotel for three months. Uh, and I'd love to watch basketball nonstop. Well, congratulations. <laughs> You're going to watch nothing but basketball and, uh, and eat room service. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because this is a whole separate discussion. We don't need to go too far down this path, but the, 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 the role that media played, we were, we were suddenly interviewing athletes in the same format that we're doing right now. You know, I'm sitting in my office and I'm interviewing athletes um, who are on zoom calls, perhaps from their homes or their offices as well. We didn't have that in-person access. Um, I went to the sec championship uh, in, in December purely because I wanted to get out of the house. I, mean, I wanted to go and see something different, uh, but I knew I wasn't going to get any special access. I just sat down at Mercedes Benz stadium and I sat and watched the game in the press box rather than at my house. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of opportunity to get to get inside these bubbles and it, it changes the dynamic mm -hmm. substantially. Um, and that's a, that's a different issue that we need to talk about here, but it, it, I think it leads to a lot fewer compelling stories because the, the connections are so tight and narrow and, and, and few. Okay. So that word of connections. So one of the things that also, and I think this has continued to play out, um, when sports came back in a bubble, even though the American sports fan had been starved for live content, the ratings were not, were not there. Yeah. Um, I want to say by memory, the NHL finals were down about 60%, NBA 50%. I think the NFL was off about 10% this year, 7 right. to 10%. Right. And I just saw this morning that the NBA All-Star game ratings were down I think 24% from last year. So what is the, what, from your perspective, what, what's happening to American sports? There's so many different angles to take on this. And I've, I've dug deep on the NFL side of things, but it applies across the board. Uh, there were a number of people who insisted that it was because the NFL got political and, uh, and, that that's why fans were tuning out. That doesn't seem to really hold out on any large scale because the numbers, if, if people were boycotting the NFL, then they'd boycott everything. But the numbers, strangely enough, seem to go up much higher for a, you know, for a Chiefs Bucks game than they went for, you know, I don't know, the Rams Titans game. You know, it's, it, it isn't necessarily the, the, um, event itself, but the specific matchup that drives NFL fans. What I think is a bigger scale is just fatigue. I mean, we were talking earlier about how I think that everyone is kind of fatigued of, of, of everything right now that's not, that, that, that's, you know, all, staring at computer screens, staring at phones, all of this. There's just something to be said for getting outside. I mean, I can look out my window now and see that it's a bright, sunny day here in Atlanta and, and, and you know, I can't wait to get outside. And, and I think that there's a number of people that, that realize that sports has its place, but there are so many bigger elements to life. And, and I'm not just talking about getting out in the sunshine. Uh, you know, when you were consumed with the news, the way that we were between the, the, the presidential election and the, and the social justice movement and, the, and obviously the pandemic, you have less tolerance for sitting and watching sports. I don't watch as many games as, as I used to if I don't have to because – I just look elsewhere or try to uh, try to get away from the screen entirely. This is kind of a meandering answer, but the answer is there's no one answer, but yeah. uh, sports are still absolutely the king. I mean, the NFL just saw, is, um, is just about to sign some monster broadcast deals. The ratings are going to bounce back. Uh, they might not bounce back to pre pandemic levels for a while, but they will bounce back. It, you know, I, absolutely. I mean, you know, one of the things that people have got to remember and I can, from a marketing professor perspective, you know, there's different segments out there. And, you know, I mean, you know, as you were talking um, sort of about some of the, the you know, their stuff that had gone on in parallel, you know, I found myself thinking about the, um, one of the reasons I've seen for the All-Star game having lower ratings is because that coincided with the Meghan Markle interview with Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> yeah, that was a monster. <laughs> 
I, and, and so, but also the thing I, you know, caught in what you're saying is like this idea of fatigue and something in there also is, you know, have habits fundamentally changed? Yeah. Yeah. Will people go out to like, from my perspective, my guess is things like the NFL, this kind of event Sunday, Sunday afternoon, will people get in their cars to go to Tuesday night games? Yeah. That's what I, you know, I mean, do you think, do you think that the cycle is, is sort of corrupted? I mean, I mean, it's, it's an excellent question. That's, that's the one that I actually didn't bring up that I, that I should have earlier in terms of, of disrupted routines. You know, when you've got an NBA finals in October and a, you know, and a Stanley cup in September and a Kentucky Derby and whatever that was September and a masters in November, that throws off all of the rhythm. You know, we all have a rhythm as sports fans that we expect to see events unfold in a certain order. And they didn't, they were completely out of order um, last year. And I think that that was a significant element of it, but going forward. Yeah. I mean, in terms of, of live events, it's going to be, next year before a lot of people feel comfortable and even, maybe not even then feel comfortable going to a full stadium, despite the fact that some stadiums are opening up full, you know, Texas is opening up the Rangers. They say they're going to have a full house for opening day. I mean, they might, but I'm not going to be there. So it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how, how many people are willing to just jump back into pre pandemic life. Are the Florida baseball teams doing something similar? Are we going to? I have not hear? heard, um, but I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised. They're, you know, they're, they're similarly, I mean, Florida obviously has its own issues in terms of, of virus transmission, so I'd be surprised. But, but uh, I mean, by the end of the season, I don't see why not. You know, right. after, after the middle of the summer, I don't see why most places wouldn't be open full to full capacity. Okay, so if I ask you to go into full forecasting projection <laughs> mode which of the major leagues or entities so we'll, we'll broaden it to golf and, and nascar who do you think has the best prospects coming out of covid19 and who do you think is going to struggle uh, that's a good question. I'm going to say the NFL straight off the bat has the absolute best prospects. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, like I mentioned the broadcast contracts, uh, Jerry Jones just signed Dak Prescott to a monster deal. And he basically showed his cards and said, yeah, I absolutely did this because we got more broadcast money coming. Not only that gambling is coming. It's already legal in, in 20 States. It's going to be illegal. It's going to be legal in, in most of the country within the next five years. And, and the NFL, the other leagues are getting ahead of that by, by taking a piece of the action. That's going to be a huge driver. The NFL is at that sweet spot between having enough storyline to keep you interested, but not having so much product that you get oversaturated the way that the baseball and basketball and other ones do. Um, as for the league, that's going to fare the worst. I don't, the NBA is, is a global league, but it is very definitively entrenching itself in one particular worldview. It is embracing politics and it is embracing a worldview unlike any other sport has. And, you know, and, and I would add the WNBA to that as well. So I think it's going to be incredibly healthy within a certain segment of fans. And then there's going to be a huge segment of fans that say, you know, they're, LeBron's not as good as Michael Jordan. I stopped watching the nineties. I'm done with this. So yeah, I mean, it's going to be they're, they're each other, all the other sports have their own little issues, but I would say that if you were a betting person, put your money on the NFL. Yeah, I, I grew up in Chicago, as you know, Jay. So I, I don't even think there's a debate about that. Um, the Jordan LeBron situation. <laughs> Let, quick follow up on the NFL, and then we'll move to storytelling. Yeah. What do you think about the the notion that the NFL is in a way now following the NBA in terms of being a star driven league, where suddenly quarterbacks have monster guaranteed deals and are other players going to follow quarterbacks a la Gronkowski and Antonio Brown? I think that the, the question is, yeah, they're going to follow them. Yeah. The latest that I've heard is that, that Brady's trying to get Odell Beckham down to uh, Tampa. So you know, it's just, he's going to, he's going to basically assemble my 2017 fantasy football team down in Tampa. He's going to be good to go. Uh, the, 
for for the NFL teams, it's not so much a star driven system as it is a play is a, a quarterback driven system. Mm-hmm. And a quarterback, a good quarterback, not to get too far in the weeds here, but a, a good quarterback is table stakes. You know, if you want to be able to get to the playoffs, it is exceedingly rare that you can get there without a, a, a strong quarterback. You've got to have something really overcompensating in the other direction. Um, and there are probably only about 15 or so quarterbacks uh, that, that can take a team to the next level on their own. Now, there are 32 teams, so you can see the problem there is that, is that there's that variance in there. But the NFL, as a, as a league, has always prided itself on the shield coming first. And, and I, they make sure that the league is the one that's in charge. And it, it, in a way, it's not, it's not quite as star-driven as the NBA um, but there is absolutely that that focus on quarterbacks, and you're right. That's where the money is going. Okay, Jay, I want to now change direction, okay? And this is something that you and I have talked a little bit about over the years. I, I, you know, me, I think, often making sort of parallels that may seem a little iffy that in, in some ways we're in the, the same business. I'm trying to understand consumers or understand fans while you're trying to tell stories that captivate fans. And so, and again, I, 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 I should ask this question better, but I'm going to come up with something very broad. So, I mean, how do you think about your craft as a sports writer? How often do you like think about the, the fan as a consumer? Literally every day. I mean, I have to be thinking about that. Um, I, if I don't, you know, if it, it, then then I'm just kind of writing things that no one's going to read. I mean, I would love to do, for instance, I love NASCAR. I love writing about NASCAR. I love digging in deep into the personalities, the way that the garage works, the way that the strategy works. But NASCAR does not resonate with as broad a swath of people as the NFL does. It's just fact. You know, for every one NASCAR fan, there's 10 NFL fans. And, and that's just a fact. I could spend you know, weeks on a NASCAR driver and, and it would get one-tenth of the reads of a, of a column that I do on the NFL. So I always have to be aware of what is compelling to the, to the reader. Not only that, they get their information instantly. I can't be spending the time telling them, you know, what the score was in the game, what happened in a game. I've got to show them something different. I've got to bring, bring a different perspective. I've got to tell the story that they know in a different and more compelling way there's otherwise they don't have any reason to, to, to follow after me. They already know what the score of the game is. They know that instantly. They already know who the big, they, they probably already know what the big plays were, but they might not know why that big play happened. They might not know what went into that game. And so that's what I've got to do is focus on that element of it, that outside element, what they don't already know, what they're not already aware of, because otherwise, you know, what's the, what's the need for them to come to me? Okay, so let me, let me make one quick point to the audience. So guys, absolutely fill in your thoughts, your comments, your questions in the, in the Q&A so Doug can start to put these things together. Um, Jay, as you were saying that and this idea of why are they coming to you, do you ever think about how you're going to get the next generation? How are you going to get the kids that get their news, their sports news? And I don't know if this is possible, but if, I, if I'm 15 years old and I get my sports news from TikTok, how is Jay Busby going to get them? <laughs> Jay Busby, a 52-year-old man with gray in his beard, has to think a little bit more laterally. You know, uh, For instance, I just uh, yesterday afternoon, I did a long voiceover for uh, an augmented reality story that we did on the, the COVID shutdown. I wrote a column for it, so there's the text. But then I did a voiceover where you pick up your phone, you look through and you scroll through it uh, and you can see the unfolding calendar of the time. And as you do that, you can hear my dulcet tones walking you through and giving you a little background. So it's, it's different. I mean, you know, I would love to be in a world realistically, or, you know, th- theoretically, where I've got, you know, books behind me, a million of them, where the author went and did this long, three-month-long jaunt following around Secretariat or whatever. I would love to be able to do that. That's not realistic for almost anyone in today's environment. Uh, so I've got to be thinking more about how to reach that, that audience. Now, storytelling is, you know, it, it sounds like it's archaic, but it's absolutely universal. I mean, TikTok is full of this stuff. TikTok is 
nothing but stories. My daughter's on TikTok and she likes two things. She likes pictures of cute dogs and she likes pictures of people hurting themselves. So, or videos <laughs> of people hurting themselves. So, I mean, what is, it, you, we've seen a million of these. What is a guy going down and dunking on a rim in his, in his driveway and then pulling the rim down and clonking himself on the head? What is that but a little small story? You know, it's, it's, got, it's got start, climactic moment, dramatic end. And, and so that's a little tough to replicate. You know, I'm not going to go out and, and pull down my basket on my head, but you need to, it, the point is that people are always looking for those kinds of stories and you just have to figure out how to tell them in a way that keeps them hooked, that keeps them connected and keeps them working along that line. People want to know more than just the score. People want to know the story behind it. So do you think, um, do you think it, I mean, maybe it's always been this way, but the world almost evolves to TikTok is the elevator pitch kind of approach to storytelling. The five minute read is the, and I'm putting this in business terms, the PowerPoint yeah. deck. Right. And then the, the, there's still the book, the book length three month following around secretariat treatment. Do you think, um, well, I mean, I, and, and I know you've kind of touched on it. Is there, if you think about telling those stories in those different formats, number one, are you going to be in a world where you're going to try and tell stories in all those 30 seconds, five minutes, two weeks? Is there something to think about that you got to, you got to do it differently? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can't stay still, you know, you can't just, just sit still and do the same thing. I mean, my job did not even exist when I graduated college, my daughter's about to graduate college and, and, and she's looking around for a job and, and, and some of her colleagues have called me about writing and things like that. And, and I, I, I don't want to say, I, it's tough to give career advice because what I do, like I say, didn't even exist for, wouldn't exist for another 15 years after I graduated. So the media environment is always changing. And if you try, if you think that you're going to be able to do the same thing now as you do in five years, you, you know, you're, you're not, you just need to be aware of that. And you need to be figure out how to tell the same story in different ways um, and, and figure out how to align yourself in the right direction with the right team and the right people to be able to tell those stories. I think that there is still a hunger for those longer stories. I think that, that one thing that we have seen is that people, if they, if, if the story is compelling enough, they will sit down, they will read the story all the way through. Um, last year, yeah, last year, 2020, there was a huge wreck at the end of the Daytona 500 where Ryan Newman, uh, a driver, it, it literally looked like he died. It looked like he died right there on the track. And the way that he was taken out and extracted and he, and he walked out of the hospital two days later was nothing short of a miracle. For this year, I did a real deep dive on that. I went and talked to uh, medical officials, talked to Newman himself, talked to all kinds of people and wrote a you know, like 3,000 word story on it. And, and it got a lot of, of positive response because it went so deep and it was a compelling story that people were interested in. I mean, this is, you know, not, not my doing. The story was interesting no matter what I did, but, but I took the time to, to put it all together. And, and I think that that's where the, the secret sauce lies for um, these longer stories is it has to be something phenomenally compelling. You can't just go and tell a story about you know, the, the brave second baseman and, and write 3000 words on it and expect anybody, but the absolute hardest of hardcore fans to follow you. Hmm. Uh, I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to throw you almost maybe a little bit of a curveball here because right. uh, sort of two marketing questions occurred to me um, as you were going through that um, description. Um, in terms of analytics, uh, as a journalist in a digital space, um, how much do analytics impact you and influence you in terms of what you do? Hugely, hugely. I mean, if you if you're one of those cranky old people that that says, "I just I, all I do is watch for batting average and RBI and that's it," and you don't know what uh, you know value over replacement player or any number of other advanced statistics are, you're screwed. I mean, you're 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 a dinosaur, and and I don't like to be that dismissive but if you have that mindset that there is nothing new that's going to be developed you know you you're you're on the wrong edge of the curve there so yeah analytics are hugely important and and i am always trying to incorporate them into my work uh, numbers in and of themselves are not really fascinating to me because i'm a words guy but numbers that tell a story 
They are. The NFL has a, this whole series of next gen stats. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you just do a little bit of digging in those, you can find out some really fascinating stuff. I, I don't remember the exact percentages, but uh, I was doing a story on Russell Wilson last year, and I remember digging into the analytics, and he had something like three of the top 14, top 12 most difficult passes completed up to that point in the year. I mean, they, they, these passes with completion percentages, theoretical completion percentages of 6.8%. You know, he was making these amazing throws, and it was a way to, to tell a story about how, how good this guy was without just relying on the typical sorts of, you know, he looks like he's running, running, passing well. But yeah, analytics are hugely important. And do you get analytics on what you do? Clicks. Oh, my personal ones? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it doesn't reach the point where, you know, there's almost like a formula that says if I write about a quarterback in the NFL, I get this. If I write about a bull yeah. rider in Duluth, I get. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that is exactly. I mean, to yeah. the point that we often joke about it. You know, we've joked that if you stick, uh, well, it used to be in the, in the mid 2010s, if you put Tim Tebow in a headline, you know, you were guaranteed X number of clicks. And, and for the last four years, it was if you put Trump in the headline, boom, you know, there you go. Uh, but the, the, the problem is that a lot of that time, it's cheap calories. You know, and if you just go and manufacture a story, then it's just cheap calories. So the trick, obviously, you know, you've got you've to think about, a good story, but you got to realize that, Hey man, a good story might be on Tom Brady. Uh, the, the bar for a Tom Brady story is the best way to put it. The bar for a Tom Brady story is way down here and the bar for, you know, Ryan Tannehill story is way up here. <laughs> okay. So uh, let's uh, switch to Doug with some of the office questions. Um, but one last thing is Doug gets organized. Did you have, and I'm sorry, I, I don't know if this is the case. Did you write anything about maybe the world's worst Tom Brady story of him throwing the trophy from one boat to another? <laughs> I love that. I did not write it. I did not write about that one, but I love that. I, that, that made me so, so happy. And, you know, now that I'm thinking about it right now, what I should have done, I don't remember where I was when I saw that, but I wasn't in a position that I could write. But what I would have liked to do is go and like talk to divers and say, all right, what's that? What's that waterway like? Yeah. What if you had to go down and get that thing? What would have been done? So yeah, now, now I'm kicking myself for not doing that story. But yeah, I mean, how far down is that? I don't know. I mean, what's, what's under there? What kind of, what kind of uh, nightmares would you find if, that, if the Lombardi Trophy had sunk to the bottom? But I love that. I love that bit. Okay, Doug. So what is, what is the audience asking? Yeah, first question is from Craig. Craig is a former Talladega Super Speedway PR intern. Uh, he's always seen himself as a decent writer, especially when it comes to feature stories. One of the things he struggles with is the lead. Jay, how do you suggest getting readers' attention in those first few lines? Yeah, that's that's a great point. I mean, and, and this goes to what you were saying earlier, Mike, about uh, different storytelling methods. You can't spend a whole lot of time winding up and telling the, and describing the the verdant pastures that uh, upon which secretary at roamed or anything like that you can't spend a whole lot of time with that garbage you've got to get right into it and and for me a lot of times the lead sometimes the lead will suggest itself you know sometimes you'll see like in a in a game you will see a play and you'll know you know what that's it that is the that is the point that this entire game is pivoting around you know the super bowl win where, uh, where the, the Patriots intercepted Russell Wilson's pass to, to clinch the game. You can tell that that right there is your pivot point. But a lot of times you don't find it until you get into it. But you've got to find that point where you, 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 it's the point that makes you want to read more. You know, we all, we all know a million stories. We can go on Twitter. We can go on Facebook. We can see what, a million different stories. But what is that point? What is that interest point that makes you want to read what happens next and, and it's certainly not chronological you know the, the sun rose over Talladega super speedway no you don't want to read about that you want to read about the the what happened uh, in the last half mile there where, where Denny Hamlin and Brad Keselowski are battling it out for the lead so you want to figure out what that what that pressure point is and then work backwards from there I feel like you have an inner poet in you Jay at some point <laughs> that's gonna <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, you know, it's funny you say it because I did go to, uh, I did go, I, I have a Master of Fine Arts at, at the University of Memphis, and I spent all kinds of time reading a lot of really good poetry and a lot of really bad poetry. So I have an extensive okay. English major background. 
All right. Uh, this next one is a bit of a follow up to that question. This is from George Buckley. George is asking, having experienced riding in the highly competitive and passionate CAA sports world for the flat hat, how do you create a compelling narrative in sports or topics where there isn't that same kind of passion generated by the tentpole events, such as the Super Bowl, the Final Four, or the Masters? How do you uncover that compelling story within those leagues and those games? Well, shout out George the Flat Hat. That's, that's the William Mary newspaper. That's where I started. Uh, I love that place, you know, flat hat for life. But uh, beyond that, I mean, the, the, the frustrating thing is that everybody's got a good story. Every single person that's, you know, within the sound of my voice, every single one of us has a great story, you know, and a compelling story. We've got some story, multiple stories in our past that are worth telling, that are worth relating to other people. The trick is, is, is finding those stories, figuring out what those stories are, because a lot of times now, and this is not quite what you're asking, but I'll get back to it. A lot of times now athletes have so much control over their image that they don't want anything out there that, that detracts from their own self-created narrative. Um, in terms of finding something smaller, you know, it's, it, it just, it requires a little bit more digging. It requires a little bit more understanding who the players are, who the, who the um, individuals are that are involved with, you know, say a smaller scale basketball team. I mean, let's be honest, one of the greatest sports book ever written Friday Night Lights. And that was about a high school team in the middle of nowhere, Texas. And Buzz Bissinger was able to find some absolute eternal human truths in a little scrubby high school town. So uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's out there. It's not quite as, as set up for you on a tee, but I mean, it can be so much more rewarding. And just a little side note here, it's a lot less competitive. You know, you're not, you're not fighting with uh, dozens of other people to, to get that interview with Rob Gronkowski. You're looking at, at, at one individual and they're often a lot more willing to talk to you. This next question is something that I think a lot of people were probably wondering uh, and, and have an opportunity to hear from someone like yourself who does this for a living. So how has your profession changed the way that you watch and enjoy sports, knowing that you're going to have to write? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a great question because, I mean, I got to be honest, when, when I am um, out at, you know, well, now it's like fires when we sit around and socially it doesn't fires and, and, you know, everyone will be like, yeah, did you see the Celtics game? And I'm like, can we please talk about anything other than sports, <laughs> anything other than sports, you know, and, and, and that's a little bit of overstatement. I enjoy, I enjoy talking, but you know, it's, it can be a little bit of fatigue. You know, I, I, I want to talk about, I don't know, the Queen's Gambit or whatever. And, they, and everyone else wants to, wants to talk about uh, what happened in the playoff game last weekend, but it can be a little bit of a fatigue, but by the same token, you know, it's, it's kind of fun. It's kind of, it, it's fun to, to watch a game and, and I watch a game sort of two ways, you know, sometimes I'll just turn a game on and if I know that I'm not covering it for any reason, I can kick back and enjoy it. But if I know, you know, like an NFL game, I've always kind of got little antenna up and saying, all right, what's going on here? What's happening here? Is there something I can follow up on here? So it's, it's a different sort of watching, but, uh, at, but nine times out of 10, it's, you know, it's, it's a lot more fun. And a lot of times, you know, I know the backstories here. I know what's going on. And so if I'm watching with friends or family, I can say, Hey, you know, let me tell you a story about this guy here. Let me tell you a story about what happened uh, that leading up to this play here. But um, yeah, it is definitely not quite the same experience as just being able to kick back with a, with a beer and watch a ball game. I would absolutely imagine uh, it's quite a different experience for you. Okay, so our next question, uh, it pertains to the conversation we had earlier about the kind of shut up and dribble mindset uh, that many fans have in sports. The question is, if athletes are employees, can owners impose limits on their speech? Don't companies do the same thing in other industries? Yeah, they do. That's an excellent question. And, and they can, but they made the decision that um, it was, it, they, they allowed their employees to speak. And, and I heard this a lot from people. They would say, well, my boss doesn't let me protest on time, so they shouldn't either. Well, their boss does. I mean, and, you know, a, a kind of a complimentary example, complimentary with an E, is, is social media. Um, there are various media outlets that will not let their uh, reporters tweet on anything political, nothing. I mean, you can't even say, I went to vote today. Um, you just, you have to be sports and nothing but sports. There are other media outlets that let their uh, reporters and their writers tweet on anything. They can, they can, you know, rant about Trump or Biden or whatever they want to. So 
it's, it's, it's incumbent on the company rather than the employee. And again, companies can have these, uh, teams can have these, these strictures in place. And, and this is a, the thing that, that a lot of people who were in support of the protest didn't quite get is that companies can have a say in how you present yourself publicly. And if you don't like that, you don't have to work for that company. I mean, if you, if you're not uh, a fan of how you're, you're being allowed to present yourself and allowed, you're allowed to speak your mind, then, you know, you can, you can look elsewhere for work. And that's not always as easy to do if you're talking about working in the NBA or the NFL, but that's the thing is, is if you are wearing a, 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 you know, a team logo across your chest, you are by definition representing that team. And if that team makes the decision that they don't want you speaking out on political matters, you know, it's, it's a, it's a murky area. And I imagine that this is something that will come up in contracts more, but um, you know, as, as we see going forward, if the players are allowed to speak their mind, but, as most contracts are written, they do have a clause that allows them to, to, you know, discipline employees for violating what they see as, as uh, misrepresenting the team brand. It also turns out that the queen can't regulate the speech of the princesses. So I mean, <laughs> we may be in a different world. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, next question. You touched on this earlier. I think some, some of our participants joined us a little late. So, um, once all pro sports had shut down, what was your thought process on what to write about, uh, such as sports flashbacks versus best players ever in certain sports versus covering youth football in, in Tampa or something along those yeah, lines? Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the difficulty, yeah, I, I saw who asked that question. I know who asked that one. That was, that was my brother in Tampa. So <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm really mad at him now because his city has gotten all kinds of championships and mine hasn't gotten any. So, you know. Screw Tampa. But beyond that, uh, what you, it was interesting. We, we had a, a whole situation where, if you remember, there was this huge rush of, of, of retrospectives, you know, that we were like, and we were writing about classic games and we were writing, you know, interviewing uh, uh, old athletes and, and writing about historical stuff. And, and for about six months or six weeks or so, that carried everybody. You know, we would, would go back and we would watch the 1995 World Series. And then after a while, everybody was like, all right, enough. We've seen enough of that. So you have to go and you have to find something new. And, and that's where it gets tricky is trying to find new stories when nobody's doing anything. I remember one thing that we did do was, you know, we had the Olympics coming up and this is back when we thought the Olympics were still going to happen. Um, how, do our, how are athletes training? You know, what are they doing in their homes? And so we did a whole series of stories on athletes swimming in their pools and, and uh, you know, working out at home and trying to train to an Olympic level in their own garage. And so that was a pretty fascinating story that, you know, sadly, as it turned out, it was, it was all for naught. They had to wait for another year. Gotcha. Well, Jay, I got a personal question for you. Uh, not not a personal question, but it's my <laughs> my personal <laughs> question. <laughs> um, sports journalism is an industry that that is very difficult to break into, and I'm I'm sure there's someone in our audience who's looking to break into and maybe listening to you, hoping to to pick up some nuggets on that. Yeah. I have no idea what it was like when you were entering the industry. But in this day and age, what would be your advice to, say, a college student who has dreams of, of writing sports stories for Yahoo, who's just looking for an opportunity to break into the field? Well, first of all, don't come for my job. But uh, beyond that, uh, I would say just write. Just, just write constantly. I mean, you don't have your own voice. With rare exception, people don't have the voice that will get them paid well uh, when they're 20, 21, 22, 23 years old. They, they're working their way into their voice. And the only way that you find that is by writing, by constantly writing. Um, what I tell people now, what I would have told people five years ago, 10 years ago, was start a blog. You know, that's how I got into it. I started a blog about Southern uh, sports and, and it caught the attention of people at Yahoo and I got hired. Um, now I would say start a newsletter. And, and I, would have, I would say, you know, write what you want to write and then leverage email because email is is even though it's like an old technology that's one of the few technologies where you still have people's attention closely and and you have them you know they're not on social media with things flying by in every direction but but the, the primary goal is just to write figure out what it is that you want to write about what you want to create and just keep writing at it even if nobody reads it just keep creating keep pushing forward keep and 
keep putting stories out there in the world. And, and if you are dedicated enough, it will happen. I mean, the, the, the trick is that the only way to get to this is through dedication. Um, you know, you, there, are, there are innumerable people who want these kinds of jobs. There are not innumerable people who are willing to stick with it through all of the lean times to get to the point that you want to get to. And so um, if you have that, that tenacity to keep writing and then to, to keep sticking with it, even when things look really grim, that's what's going to get you through. I mean, this is, you've heard the old expression, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Getting a job in sports media is an ultra marathon and, and you know, it's, it never really ends. So that's co become comfortable with that, become comfortable with continuing to write and that's how you get there. Great. Well, that wraps up our questions, at least the questions that have not already been answered. Um, sports league that's going to grow the most, I believe you said was, was NFL post COVID. I would say, yeah, I mean, I would say that, like, you know, in terms of the league that might grow the, the most, you know, you want, we talked about this before, but uh, but soccer is obviously making huge inroads in America. And, and I, okay. I hope that, that, you know, won't be dovetailed by COVID, but that's that's a good question. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, well, Mike, do you want to wrap this up? Maybe uh, yep. give a little push for our, for our next webinar as well? Absolutely. So first off, you know, big thanks to Jay. Always appreciative of what you bring to the place. Um, we do not share your official view about the city of Tampa, but we go, <laughs> but we uh, we I sympathize with it. <laughs> I love Tampa, but uh, but yes, it, they've got too many championships. And uh, th you know, and so just as a look ahead for everyone out there, our next webinar again follows the theme of you know bringing people that you know operate in the world of intense consumer passion and fandom. But from a different perspective, we're going to have Ann and Sid Mashburn, um, a, a couple of folks that uh, have a chain of, well, a chain of clothing stores and also very active in clothing design. So a, essentially a fashion brand that has been able to get beyond of just being someone that sells clothes to actually having fans out there. If you look at the coverage of Ann and Sid, it's absolutely phenomenal in places like GQ and, and Vogue. So kind of a, another glimpse in terms of the, the business of consumer passion. And as always, you know, uh, for, for more content, you can always find us on the web at fandomanalytics.com. Always check into the Fanalytics podcast on a weekly basis. And with that, again, one final thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Jay Busby. And the after party starts now.